Good. Okay, so <laughs> this is my uh, presentation on research methodology that I've done for Music Tech. Uh, I chose to do recording and the multi track recorder, uh, the different types, uh, the evolution of it, so how it went from sort of roughly from one track onwards and the impact that that's had on the music industry. The first bit of research I did was, was on the internet, I went onto YouTube and I found the first ever sound recorded in 1860 by um, <laughs> Edward Leon Scott de Martinville and it sounds like this. It was the first time ever recorded, and it was on a device called the Phon Autograph. Um, it was apparently it was supposed to be a uh, recording of a woman singing "Oh Claire de Lune." So I then, uh, staying on YouTube, found the most recent recording of "Oh okay, Claire de Lune" that I could find on YouTube, which oh, that's the wrong button. Excuse me. Um, sounds like this. Sounds very different. Cool. Well, you can hear the difference in the sort of sound quality. Um, and that was recorded in 2010. Um, so I went on to research the phonograph more, I went on to Wikipedia while I was on the internet and it confirmed it's the earliest known recording device. Uh, it could record sound but it couldn't play it back. Um, so I found out how, how they played it back, which was actually on the, it was on the same site. It was a guy called Charles Cross um, found out that the recordings could be turned back o um, into sound by photo engraving the tracks into a metal service to create a playable groove. Uh, then a stylus and a diaphragm similar to the fun autographs was uh, used to reverse the recording process and sort of recreate the sound that way, which I thought was quite cool. Um, whilst I was on Wikipedia, um, I went on to multi-track recording and um, I found obviously the word uh, Ampex came up quite a lot, which is uh, an electronic company founded in 1944 and they made a lot of multi-track recorders. Um, based on Les Paul's concept, which I've underlined here, so I'm going to look into that further. Um, the Model 200 was Ampex's first tape recorder, which I've got here. It's a long video, it's one of the first ones in, I think. First for the portable tape recorder, because many manufacturers made their own tape recorders to their own standards around 1950 to 51. This one here. This is the Ampex 200. So it looked like this. First sold to the military. So it's quite, it quite a good sort of bit of information there as well, I think. Um, yeah, they made professional 8-track recorders during the late 1950s. Um, recorded eight tracks onto one tape, which is a set based on Les Paul's concept. And the project was overseen, it's seen as a special project. It was overseen by Ross Snyder. Um, another name that I've underlined, I thought was quite a key person in this sort of multi track process, was Tom Dowd. And he introduced the Ampex eight track to Atlantic Records, and uh, they produced the first track uh, um, from Atlantic Records recorded on eight track. That's the logo there. Okay, so I went on to research Les Paul uh, a bit more and found that um, Ampex, they built an 8-track recorder based on his concept and they sold, sold it to Les Paul for $10,000 in 1955. That's a lot of money. Um, 
I then found on YouTube uh, Les Paul had developed and recorded Hey Hi The Moon using 24 tracks that he'd overdubbed. Uh, I've got a link here. Now, how many tracks, course. what's the most tracks you've ever made? Well, the most that we've put out on the market uh, is 12 guitars and 12 Mary singing. Does that mean 24 tracks? Very good. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, <coughs> could you play that back to us and maybe put in a 25th? Sure. Well, it'll it. actually be uh, 26 because Mary will sing one and I'll play one. 26, 26 tracks of How High the Moon. changed with all the doubling of vocals and overdubbing of guitar. Um, How High the Moon's little fact, spent 20 week, 25 weeks in the charts. <laughs> um, I then went on to research Tom Dowd, what I didn't put actually in this presentation, which I should say is um, I actually found Tom Dowd on, in Sound on Sound magazines, and they really promoted the Tom Dowd, the language of music documentary. Um, so I, I watched the documentary and I found, I found another clip on YouTube um, which is just him summarising the, the benefits of, of digital from analogue. Um, here's another video. I'll only play a quick one of this because this is the last video. One of the ways that I think that I, where I could feel I could really trust Tom was that I'd seen how musically proficient he was, which is something that I use whenever I thought body else that I'd ever met. They're my principles in one form or another. <laughs> 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 By the 80s, the method of recording starts to change yet again. And we're not recording analog anymore. We are storing information digitally which is a much purer, much simpler form of capture and easier to reproduce. The musicians today have changed their form of expression because a musician today can walk around and for hours perfect, listen to something, record something, play it back, say I want to change it, play it, play it, play it, play it. And finally, with the aid of computers, they can say, I want to use this note from here, I want this sound over here, and shake and bake, reassemble it in any configuration, so that the whole creative form of expression has a new horizon made available by the fact that there is now digital capture. The thing that has stayed the same all through it is music as a form of expression. Yes, yeah, so that kind of, uh, as he said there, he was able to store information on the desks. Uh, he had the motorised faders. Quite a big thing there was the interaction with the DAWs and how they could sort of manipulate the sound, uh, which is much, much easier than before. Um, Tom Day had, had a massive sort of impact on the multi-track recording um, era. He was, he was an American recording engineer. He actually worked in the army uh, for quite a lot of time. And he actually worked on the, the A-bomb which he didn't know about, they told him a lot later, which was actually on the longer documentary. Um, he worked mainly for Atlantic Records, and he was credited for innovating the multi-track recording method. Uh, he, he was the guy that pioneered the linear faders, whereas before they were sort of round. Um, and as I said before, he enabled Atlantic Records to be the first record company to record on multi-track. Um, after this, I went on Google Documents, not um, Google Scholar, and I couldn't find too much, but I found a link 
or somebody referencing this, which is an Audio Engineering Society recording timeline, which has got a lot of stuff on it, so I won't go through all of it, but it's got some great um, dates of sort of uh, landmark times for recording. So I've actually summed up on the last slide here the timeline key points. So in 1881, uh, the first stereo effect, and 1933, BASF had the first plastic magnetic tape. In 1940, Fantasia recorded on 8-track stereophonic sound. Uh, 47, Ampex produced the first of many tape recorder. 1950, Les Paul modified Ampex 300 to create his first overdub effect, which is similar to the video that I showed you with How High the Moon. Um, 55, Ampex developed the selective sync recording, which made it a lot easier to overdub. Uh, in 57, Les Paul creates the first 8-track recording. 75, digital tapes started to be used in professional studios. 86, the first digital console starts to appear. And in 1991, Elisis revealed the first affordable multi-track recording, recorder. Um, and from there, there's quite a few different companies coming out with affordable multi-track recorders. But um, that was the first of the first, you see what I mean? Um, and that's my research methodology. Thank you. <laughs>